Thanks for joining me for another review here at Aaron's Audio Corner. Today I have the Acoustic Energy AE 100 MK2. I received these pair of speakers from a viewer who I really appreciate you loaning these out to me for review. Uh, to be honest, they're not really my cup of tea, but rather than just tell you that and give you some flowery words, I'm going to try to do a good job of explaining to you the specifics of why I didn't personally care for the way the speaker sounds and relate that to Sam. Sam? some objective data. I always listen to the speakers first before I measure them. I listened to the speakers and then I measured them and then I looked at the results and I said, well, maybe maybe this is what's going on. So I listened to the speakers two and a half feet off the wall. They didn't sound right. I thought, well, there's a dip in the mid range. Maybe that's baffle step compensation. Maybe I need to place them close to the wall. I did that, still didn't sound right. I thought maybe I need to turn them away from me. Don't point them directly at me. Most speakers are designed to be listened, pointed directly at you. I know a lot of people don't quite believe that, but that is the case for the majority of speakers. But in some cases, speakers are designed to be not pointed at you. So that's what I did. I pointed them away from me, about 30 degrees off axis, so where they're parallel with the back wall. I brought them out off the wall two and a half feet again. Still didn't like it. I pushed them up against the wall again. Still didn't like it. I was listening at 10 feet that time. So that's four different configurations that I tried at 10 feet. Then I did the exact same thing at six feet. Now I measured the response in room for all of these to kind of go, what? why don't I like this speaker? What is it? Because these other people like it. So is, am I missing something? Then I even measured both speakers just to make sure that they're a, a reasonably matched pair and, and they are. So it's just the design that I don't care for. And that, is really it. As far as my subjective analysis goes, I just, it's not a speaker I care for, but if you want to dive into the data and you want to maybe learn a little bit more about why I didn't care for the speaker, then, then join me. Let's go on a ride here together and we'll talk about the actual objective metrics of the speaker. Before I do that, however, let me show you a little bit of the speaker and give you some specs. These speakers retail for about $500 per pair. The midwoofer is a five and a quarter inch midwoofer. The tweeter is a one inch soft fabric dome tweeter. Crossover frequency is stated at 2.9 kilohertz. Impedance is six ohm. It is a two way design and it weighs about 20 pounds each. Now for all its cons, the one thing I do like is the, is the finish of the speaker. And as you saw in the video, it, at least I think it's a nice looking speaker. So let's look at the inside of the speaker. This is the cutout for the midwoofer, cutout for the tweeter. And then this is the cutout for the crossover and the binding post on the back. And you'll see too that it's got a slot port on the back. Now the slot port has a little shelf inside. If you've ever built a subwoofer cabinet, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's gonna be hard to show you, but I'll try. And it's up in there. Now that slot port, if you tap on it, there's some resonances in this speaker enclosure. And I kind of wonder if maybe that slot port isn't contributing to it. I don't know exactly for sure, but there's something going on in this enclosure in a couple different areas that create some problems. Here is the midwoofer, stamp steel frame, uh, maybe a polypropylene cone, I'm not 100% sure. Tweeter and a little waveguide, not a big magnet, so I'm not expecting this speaker to have a lot of power handling really. Um, I do like the waveguide shape though, and it looks relatively somewhat shallow, which means that directivity should be maintained because it has a waveguide, but it should be maintained without being too narrow. And we'll see that in the data. And then this is the binding post. And if I flip it around, you can see the crossover. Let's talk about the pros. As I mentioned, it does have a nice finish. And the other thing that I do find interesting about the speaker is that despite it sounding very wonky and its response being pretty bad on axis and then off axis, the linearity of the on versus off axis response is pretty well maintained, which is to say that it has good directivity. And that means that you can equalize a speaker with pretty good success. The cons though, the high frequency is just way too high in level. There is a dip in the mid range area that is either due to baffle step compensation issues or resonance and I'm leaning toward the latter now that I have a better understanding of what the inside of the speaker looks like. And that follows along with the, the internal of the speaker. There's no cross bracing. 
And the slot port seems like it could also be contributing to some internal resonances. Now, all the data we're about to look at is captured using my Clipple near field scanner it is a state of the art robotic device that it gives us anechoic data of a speaker in a non anechoic room. And this is really good for us to suss out what's going on in the speaker itself versus what's going on in the speaker when you have it in a room. And in my particular case, when I was measuring it in my room in the listening position, I was just like, why don't I like this speaker? But when I looked at the anechoic results, I said, oh, well, a lot of this is the actual speaker itself. It's not the speaker in the room. It's not the positioning. It's the actual speaker. And that's why having anechoic data is so useful. And it also helps us to understand, does it make more sense to bring a speaker out from the wall? Or is this speaker designed to be placed near a wall? And in one instance, I actually thought that this speaker was designed to be placed near a wall. And that's what I talked about earlier. But it turns out that I don't really know if that's quite the case. Impedance is what we're going to start with in the data first. And we can see that there's a resonance around 350 hertz. It shows up in the impedance. Minimum impedance is 4.7 ohm. You could actually drive this with an AVR and probably be okay in a medium sized room. The frequency response, this is what I was talking about. So what I've tried to do is capture, first of all, the average sensitivity of 84 decibels. And I've drawn that mean line through here. We can see that there's a dip in this mid range right here, which is going to make the mid range sound a bit hollow. It's going to sound sucked out a little bit in that particular area. There's this resonance again at 350 Hertz, which showed up in the impedance data, which tells me that this is structural born resonance of some sort. Then we've got this step right here. Now, originally I thought that was baffle step, but the more I look at that with other data I'm about to show you, I think that's something else. We go up through the upper mid range and then the tweeter level, and we can see that the tweeter level is just way too high. I mean, this high frequency, uh, starting around four kilohertz is bumped up about three decibels here and one and a half to two decibels on average above the mid range. The F3 at 63 hertz and the F10 at 42 hertz indicate that the speaker doesn't really get that low, but again, it's a five and a quarter inch mid woofer in my room. I got it down to the mid fifties. There was some authority with kick drum, but not a lot. Directivity down here, it's actually, I mean, the typical crossover region for a speaker like this is two to three kilohertz. That directivity looks pretty dang good right through there, which means that vertically and horizontally, the crossover does a good job of matching the tweeter response to the woofer response on and off axis. But we also see that there is this dip right here around that seven to 800 Hertz region. Now, if I go and investigate that dip a little bit more, this is what I'm using. I'm using the frequency response on axis anechoic in dark black, dark black, bold black. My goodness, dark black. It's the darkest of the blacks. All right. Um, the tweeter is in blue. The mid woofer is in red and the ports contribution is in purple, which means that I'm just putting the microphone right next to each of these components. And I'm saying, what do they contribute to the overall sound from the speaker? The midwoofer seems to have some sort of resonance or cone breakup around four to five kilohertz that shows up in this particular area. That creates that initial bump in the on-axis response in the tweeter level. Then if we go down here, there's this other bump right here. Now I thought maybe this was baffle step compensation and I thought maybe I need to put the speaker closer to a wall. But when I looked at this data, I realized that it seems like it's either a cabinet resonance or a port resonance of some sort, and it's bumping that output up. And it's causing about meh, maybe two to three decibels of additional output relative to this mid range area. That's why this particular area right here sounds hollow. Now, if I look at the estimated in room response, this is what we get for zero degrees and 30 degrees off axis horizontal. And then I draw a trend line through this. And what I like to do, and this is completely subjective, I take my notes. I look at this data and I say, all right, this is where I believe that my listening impression lines up with the data. And for this speaker, it was a little bit harder for me to figure out exactly what I didn't like about it. But when I saw the data, I thought, well, this now it makes sense because I've run into this with other speakers, the ELAC B 5.2 speaker. It's a smaller speaker. Well, I don't know if it's smaller, but it's a, it's a budget minded speaker had a similar issue where the high frequency was bumped up and you basically had two trend lines, one for the mid range, and one for the high frequency. This particular speaker, 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 you have a trend line for the lower mid range, a trend line for the upper mid range, and then I probably could have drawn a third for the high frequency. And each of these are split by about two to three decibels. Now the sharp sibilant peaking that I'm showing here, that's just because the high frequency is raised too high and level. If the crossover were adjusted, 
maybe just a simple resistor to pad this down some, that probably would have been adequate. This right through here, I believe, like I said earlier, might be due more to the resonance in the enclosure, but it could also be baffle step. I'm not 100% sure, and it could very well be a combination of both, but really what I wound up with was a dull sounding speaker on the mid-range, lower mid-range, but a bright sounding speaker on the top end. And you would never think, or at least I would have never thought that I would have combined dull and bright to describe the same speaker. But alas, here we are. Horizontal radiation width is about plus or minus 50 degrees. Vertical radiation is about plus or minus 15 degrees. And we can see that I drew these lines where there's not a notch in the upper mid-range area, the crossover region. Now really all this is saying is that if your reference point is at the tweeter, you can go above or below the tweeter by about 15 degrees and you'll have somewhat of the same sound, but it won't quite be the same. Harmonic distortion at 86 decibels, harmonic distortion at 96 decibels. This looks kind of par for the course of a speaker of its size, but I really wanted to point out in 86 decibels and 96 decibels, this 350 Hertz resonance that showed up in the frequency response and the impedance also shows up in the harmonic distortion. And it shows up at higher order levels, which means that it's more likely to be heard. If we look at multi-tone distortion full band, we can see that at the highest output level of 96 decibels, we are above my personal trend line of about 3%. You're more likely to hear distortion and a grainy sound at this highest output level. Now, this is only one speaker anechoic, and I'll talk about this in a second. If we use a crossover of about 80 hertz to see what happens if you limit the excursion of that midwoofer, this is what you get. So I'm gonna go back, and then I'm gonna go back. There's not a lot of change in that mid-range. So that indicates at least that the motor force probably just isn't strong enough to keep up with these output levels. And that's really not a surprise because again, it's a five and a quarter inch midwoofer in a $500 budget-minded bookshelf speaker. This is the compression measurement, which takes the initial output at about 76 decibels and compares it to a higher output at 102 decibels. Now on the left, I have a block and it says 76, 86, 96, 102. This is SPL at one meter anechoic, no reflection, one speaker. Then if I say, what does this translate to in the real world with a pair of speakers in the room, these are the values you get at different distances. So you'll wanna kinda of pay attention to these. Ultimately, the blue line, which is 96 decibels at one meter anechoic, is probably about the loudest you're gonna get this speaker. That translates to 105 at one meter and then 93 decibels at four meters for a pair of speakers. And I wanna note that in my past reviews, I had a calculation wrong on this. I was forgetting to add three decibels to these guys. So just keep that in mind in a few, like maybe like my last seven or eight reviews. Uh, a viewer actually pointed that out to me. I thought I fixed it, but I didn't save the file. And here we are, but luckily Alan caught it recently, a patron, and pointed out to me. So this is brand new and just updated. And I apologize for that, but you know, human error happens. What can I say? Let's talk about some comparable units. First of all, the ELAC DBR62 is a more neutral speaker, but it's about $650 per pair. It's currently on sale for 530 and that's why I included it here. Radiation pattern is about plus or minus 60 degrees as well. Then there is the KEF Q150, which retails for about, five, is it 599 MSRP? But it's almost always on sale regularly for about $350 per pair. It has a more consistent horizontal and vertical radiation, which is helpful, especially vertical, if you're walking around the room or you have multiple seats and you wanna to try to get a wider range of people listening in this window. Now, even though it's more consistent, it's not quite as wide. It's a little bit more narrow at about plus or minus 40 degrees compared to the plus or minus 50 degrees of this acoustic energy speaker. The Q150 does seem to have more linear response though. Then there is the SBS Prime bookshelf at $600 per pair. It also is a bit more linear, but there is a little bit of a high frequency bump in the top end. The big difference to me though, is that it has a much wider radiation. Instead of plus or minus 50 degrees, it's plus or minus 70 degrees. Then for the more budget minded, the ELAC debut 2.0 B 6.2, which is just the most ridiculously long name for a speaker ever, those retail typically for about 400 bucks, but you can also find them pretty regularly for $300 per pair. That particular speaker also is more linear, but it does have a pretty strong resonance in around, if I recall, about 600 Hertz or so. 
And it also is a little bit wider in radiation, horizontal radiation. So with those four speakers, personally, if you can spin up a little bit more, I would get the ELAC DBR62. If you're looking to save money, the ELAC B6.2 is also a good option over this particular acoustic energy speaker. But if you want something that is more narrow, maybe you have a very reflective room, the KEF Q150 might be a better option for you.